call them change makers. Call them rule breakers. We call them redefiners. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Redefiners. I'm Emma Coombe from the Leadership Lounge, and I'm filling in for my colleague Hoda. Today, we're talking about the healthcare industry. And gosh, does it look quite different than it was before the pandemic. Innovations like mRNA that turn our bodies into medicine factories gained a global spotlight with its role in the COVID-19 vaccines. Digital technologies, and especially AI, are transforming this industry like never before and it's becoming more agile while reducing drug research and development costs, as well as the time to market. The dream of personalised medicine is gaining traction as more diverse patient data becomes available, and it's all about getting solutions into the hands of patients faster. So, Clark, I'm very excited to hear more from our guest. What are your thoughts on what the healthcare industry is facing into? We thought we learned a lot, all of us, in the pandemic, but he is the expert, and I feel like everything we've heard about, which is changing R&D, having a culture of a company that wants to change healthcare, more positive outcomes for patients, more preventative care for patients. We're going to talk about babies and vaccines today, but also using the edge of technology, digital, AI. He says, listen, everyone in the company is using AI tools because that's how we accelerate our development. So, I, mean, I think it's going to be a fascinating discussion. Yeah, I think we are privileged to have a real leader. We all felt like we became mini experts during the pandemic, but none of us really knew what we were talking about. But uh, you'll be introducing somebody who really does know what it's like to steer one of the largest global healthcare businesses in the world. Our expert today is Paul Hudson, the chairman and chief executive of Sanofi. Paul's reshaping Sanofi into a transformative healthcare company with the ambition to really change the practice of medicine. Under his leadership, they prioritize social impact as well as health and environmental sustainability, the core of the long-term strategy. Prior to Sanofi, he was CEO of Novartis Pharmaceuticals, also spent 10 years at AstraZeneca, and is a truly global citizen, having lived and worked in the U.S., Japan, and obviously in Europe. So we are very excited to learn a lot. And Paul, welcome to Redefiners. You're one of the first non-French CEOs at Sanofi. And you took over as CEO just a few months before the pandemic hit. So what was that transition like navigating through the pandemic? Tell us a bit about that experience. On the first part, I never thought about whether I was French or not. I've run businesses in Japan, the US, Switzerland, Spain. I think it's more about being culturally sensitive and aware. And I think the board and the company were looking for somebody with healthcare experience to really take the company to the next level. So I think I qualified there. And I've um, quickly becoming a Francophile, live here, of course, for four years. My French is not perfect, but I do make an effort. And it's more around understanding cultures and their opportunities in business. And I think that's been an extraordinary gift for me, living and working here, the people that I've met and become friends. I'd taken the job just before the pandemic. I joined in September. I I laid out the 100-day plan and uh, announced the strategy on December the 10th, I think it was, 2019. And then I got a call from the uh, U.S. uh, defense group in the end of January saying, we think there's going to be declared a pandemic and you guys need to start preparing a vaccine. And we're like, okay, February, the middle of February, we've announced that we're going to go at risk because we have a different platform that was always going to take longer. And we jump in because you never knew what was going to work and was not going to work. And you can't start it two years later. So we jumped in. And then I went into lockdown like everybody else. Yeah. So running my 100-day plan from the kitchen, which was also not part of the playbook. And I said this a few times at the time. I got to see what the company was like at its best really quickly because a lot of businesses had to operate and do things very differently. And I got to really be impressed by what our people can do and how they think and how they problem solve. Then it was a sort of reverse because then I had to maintain it. Whereas a lot of CEOs come in with this five-year culture change project, I saw the best very quickly. And then it's been a question of trying to make sure that we stayed at that level. So, no, it's been a real privilege. It's an overused word by CEOs, I think, sometimes. But I wanted the job because I wanted to have an impact and add value and make things better, leave it better than I found it. I didn't want the job 
because I wanted to be CEO. And so I think I've just loved every moment of it so far, even the really tough moments. It's almost a, a double redefinition. Your mission about healthcare and your mission about Sanofi as its leader, and you've taken it through so much culturally and as a performance company. But what about yourself, if you look back in your career, whether now or before, we ask all of our guests, is there a redefining moment in your career that said, this is the moment when something pivots or something hit? We had the challenges on vaccines for COVID. There's always been a moment or two where you've had to really reflect on who you are. When I realized I wanted to lead people, not because of scale, but because I wanted to create the best possible environment for as many people as possible. And so they could be the best version of themselves. That was mid thirties and thinking, no, I really can do something here with how I approach things. The business challenges I've mentioned, we're all going to have this redefining moment right now. So rather mm -hmm. than just me on my own, AI as a disruptor means we're all at the start gate at the same time, redefining how we do almost every industry at speed and nobody's got the playbook. And so everybody's sat there going, so how do we approach it? Some are in the skeptics, the cybersecurity, others are in the massive opportunity, uh, go slow and pilot. And I see it for us in healthcare as the great disruption, the, the moment where uh, science can get turned on its head, medicines for undruggable diseases can be discovered using large language models where we can nudge people into better ideas every day. Much like when a Netflix show uh, recommends the next show and you surprised you like it, it's AI, but it's, we can have that type of nudging, I call it every day. And we made a decision. I made a decision for the company to be the first healthcare company to, to be at scale with AI. And uh, so we have 11,000 people every day using AI inside the company. And that's a redefining moment for me because I'm not a coder or a mathematician. But I see the opportunity for our company, for science, for our people to enrich themselves. How do you get the whole company using AI? What's the method and what's the, your nudge internally? The first thing you can't do is just do a series of pilots over a 10 year period, because you want to look like you're doing something, but really you're just procrastinating. What mm. you have to do is think quickly about the use cases. For us, for example, the first use case was about forecasting. Can a, can a human being forecast next year's company performance better than a large language model? And we discovered, no, they can't. Mm -hmm. the, the old adage, the sort of rock, paper, scissors, that AI beats human, but human and AI beats AI. As soon as you show the opportunity to people that actually I can just help you be even more effective, then you can go at scale. If you're doing a project wrapped in a Faraday cage in the basement, on a very highly intellectual piece of AI work in structural biology. That's a small number of people and that has to happen too. But the reality is we use more AI in our personal lives than we do in our work lives, even booking a flight, right? Or getting an Uber. It's not possible without the sophistication of artificial intelligence. So pulling that through and showing people that it's just more fun, easier, great UX, great UI so that people can really just intuitively pick it up and then off you go. And then that, the scale piece is the competitive advantage. That's where we will hopefully be a little bit ahead of our peers by doing that correctly. And Paul, is there a role of ethics in this whole question of AI? There's this containment theory, there's this piece that it could all get out of control quite quickly. And I guess with healthcare and living beings, it's quite sensitive, but what's your view on ethics and how that works with AI in your organization? We have a responsible AI code. So we know when and where to use data. We know that we don't share confidential data. We know that we don't ever know patient data. Uh, I think on one hand, you have people who think AI is like the Terminator movies and Arnold Schwarzenegger is coming back from the future yeah. to uh, uh, to change what happens next out of the Skynet phenomena, as I call it. But on the other side, it's just common sense, right? You really, you need to protect confidentiality at every level of the company, of the people we deal with. We train algorithms on data outside the company, but that we never take the data, we never see the data. 
we're just training an algorithm to be more effective. And then the algorithm returns to the company more effective at predicting with zero information in it. Huh. So that's called federated learning. And I think that's an intellectual sort of ethical leap for people to understand that the more data, the more accurate, but you can't have all the data, nor should you. Innovation has become the hallmark of Sanofi in the last few years. Gene editing, another area that's gained momentum. Uh, and you've gone from science fiction to science fact in a really short period of time. With things like CRISPR and life-changing solutions, sickle cell anemia, muscular dystrophy, the high costs sometimes put them out of reach for many people. How do you find the, the right balance of what can be done and what can be affordable and focus those efforts? It's a, it's a really great comment. So the science is really pushing itself like never before. And sometimes when you're doing incredible things, gene editing, for example, that really are for a very small handful of patients, ultimately, there, there is a cost associated with that because you're trying to to do the right thing for society and you're trying not to make a loss, of course, on doing the right things for society, different levels to that. There's three things I think of. Uh, on one hand, we supplied the 40 most essential medicines on the planet to the 30 poorest countries in the world for no profit. That's table stakes for us. Okay. At the other end, there's incredibly important breakthroughs that are for small numbers of people, like I said, where you really have to, you have to uh, go on that journey hand in hand with physicians, patients, and and payers to find the right balance. You should, at the very least, be able to demonstrate a health economic benefit to what you're doing for these people. And we have a great gene therapy effort, for example, and we're as passionate about the breakthrough science as we are about reducing the cost to manufacture, because we believe if we can reduce the cost to manufacture from literally hundreds of thousands per patient to tens of thousands, then we can bring the prices down. And then at the same time, perhaps we can consider illnesses that are untreated, but they're in larger groups, not just 10, 20, 100 people, but perhaps several thousand people who are suffering. Maybe we can help if we can just bring these medicines forwards at a much lower cost. So we have a really important effort on that. Recently, we launched uh, an immunization for RSV. And RSV right. is, you know, the number one reason why a baby goes to hospital straight after birth in the first months of its life. And, and with our partners, AstraZeneca, we make an immunization that is, you know, for a few hundred bucks can protect a baby's life and stop them going to hospital. And we have a choice, right? We can really focus on a very small number of babies that are really desperate or like we did, we made a decision, why shouldn't all babies be protected? Hmm. And if all babies need to be protected, then you need to be aware that's a big budget commitment for a, a payer or for a health system. So we have to be very responsible in making sure that they can afford to do that and that it will save them on emergency services. How do you balance breakthroughs? How do you make sure that we, the, the industry keeps researching things, even if it's only a very small number of patients, because their lives matter. And then how do you balance your benefit to society on much bigger populations? And how do you get that sort of equilibrium? Going back to the leadership element of this, we're now seeing several years later, Sanofi with innovation, with breakthroughs pushing. But as a leader in the beginning, as I recall, in your first year, you set a tone of, we as a company must embrace pushing and being more innovative, et cetera. How as a leader, did you light the spark that the culture wants to push harder, faster towards change and innovation? Because that's so many CEOs struggle with, my company's not transforming fast enough in a modern world. It's a cultural thing, right? And it's not one big thing. It's certainly not a poster by the elevator with, we are innovation led <laughs> or or internal comms, it's more, you have to really care that every decision you take and every environment you create for others to take decisions is innovation focused. And you, it's the small things, but they accumulate. It might be somebody brings an idea to you and it's got a high risk of failing. In the past, we may have said, no, that's too high risk. Find me something more conservative or something with more predictable. And it may take 
one or two conversations like that, and people soon get a new habit of playing not to lose rather than playing to win. Whereas mm. whether in public, whether one-to-one, small groups, I tried to set a drumbeat of how big could this be? How ambitious should we be? How many patients could be helped? Um, if you approach this differently, could maybe 5,000 patients with this rare disease return to a normal life? And sometimes people need permission or think they do. Sometimes people are just scared of failing, particularly people have been in the industry a long time. And so these, you have to be consistent. And I think I've been consistent since I took the leadership role of trying to help people know that we have their back if they take a risk, as long as they do it for the right reasons. You take the shot and you miss. It's okay. What do we learn? Not going for it because you're worried about failing. Everybody loses. And we have had failures, right? Yep. Don't get me wrong. Particularly yep. early on, we had two or three medicines that didn't make it. And, and we took some criticism for that. But, we, but now, that's why we're larger companies with wider portfolios. Now we can still take risks, but we do get now a nice cadence of successes. And that helps fuel people, by the way, to continue with that mindset of it's okay to go for it because just maybe we can get, we can do something important here. That, that's the most fun of the job, right? Hmm. I think people outside the industry forget that after 10 years, there'll come a moment after 10 years of developing a drug where I'm effectively handed an, an envelope and I open it and it will say it worked or it failed. It comes down to that moment. It could be a, a message, a text, could be an email, could be somebody stepping in my office. Do you have a moment? We have the results. And when they open their mouth, I don't know if they're going to say it worked or it failed. And that's the shot this industry takes every day. And we have to be comfortable with that. And Paul, just building on some of these themes and to go back to your point around RSV, having been in an ambulance more than twice with my own children ah, suffering, I that would be uh, hugely reassuring for so many parents. And I can, of course, see the cost benefit as well. So oh, yeah, I, th thanks for sharing that because we, we launched in France, Spain, and the US. We protected nearly 2 million babies this year in 23. And it's so incredible when you see the data. Some areas where they vaccinated 90% of the babies born, they have zero admissions in hospitals. Zero. Wow. Zero. And we only vaccinate up between zero and one year, really. And, but for the one year plus, the toddler, it's a terrible RSV season in the same area. The toddlers are all in the hospitals, but the babies aren't. And we'll get to them, right? Work is being done. But it shows us it's a difficult season, really difficult. And we're able to bring forward an innovation that where we want every single baby born to be protected. And maybe one of the most important things that I've been involved in my career so far, and I'm really proud of that. Very encouraging. Hope it gets to the UK soon. I was just going to ask a bit more on your talent strategy and building on Clark's questions. So in light of this fabulous culture transformation that you've led yeah. on innovation and this piece on AI, how has it changed your talent strategy? And I'm sure you've had to evolve it over the four years you've been in post. Yeah. yeah look, by the way, I'm not declaring victory. We're a work in progress like I am. So just to say we have little bright spots that accumulate and we start to feel good about momentum. I think that's where we are, momentum. We have momentum, but we're not done. There's, if I only do two things right in my tenure, it would be talent management and dynamic resource allocation. If I can make sure I have the best people and the best talent growing to help lead the sort of next wave of innovation and they're resourced, to win, to do incredible work for patients, then I'll be super proud. And most big companies have the right level of resource, but it's not always in the right place at the right time. Yeah. yeah. So that dynamic component of moving resources to opportunities and then having your best people on it or your best talent being given experiences so that they can accept that responsibility a little bit later in their career. AI has enabled that. So AI is, allow is allowing me to look worldwide. And I don't sit there, by the way, in some NASA headquarters with <laughs> 5,000 screens surrounding me or like Minority Report. I don't know if you ever saw that movie with the big transparent screens. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it's not like that. Actually, weirdly, 
it's if you're on Instagram, reels that come up on Instagram. Yes. Yeah. So you get a little reel that tells you, hey, you, you might want to take a look at this in Brazil, or hey, you might want to look at this in a manufacturing site in France, or hey, you might want to give a high five to this team over here in Germany. For it's looking at all the data and correlating it across the company and giving us nudges. Remember, I mentioned nudges to mm -hmm. to try and do things. And I think now. What's really interesting for the next generation of leaders is that the is that AI is inverting the pyramid. So most of our young leaders have only ever known a world with the internet. They know what mobile first is. They have an idea on what machine learning is. We're helping support them on AI. They're data first. They're digital natives. And so there's work going on lower down in the organization, almost junior ranks, particularly in talent, where they know more than the people above them. And so this is not like the old days. When I was a marketeer, the internet came out. Yeah. And, and at the last slide of my presentation would be, I'm considering having a website for this business. <laughs> and people would say, well, be careful of the investment there. And it's still early and we don't trust it. Much like they say about AI now, it's similar. It's a, a similar approach. And then I would, let's say I launched a website and let's say I then explained it to my boss and then my boss was able to explain it to his or her boss, right? And that's how it goes, right? You make the deck and off you go. Actually, it was acetates uh, at that point. <laughs> yeah, no, even Emma wouldn't know what that is. That's no, just we, you this should go like... to the Smithsonian, Emma, and, and you should go yeah. and see yeah, what's yeah, an yeah. acetate. Biology GCSE, Paul, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or what's a 35 millimeter slide? I started with that. That dates me. But we had to lock down a presentation two weeks before the presentation because you had to wait for the slides to come back in the Kodak carousel. But oh, that's oh, we're it. editing all that out. You're oh, I'm sorry. Your that's out. yeah. Stick don't date DG, me. Okay? Don't, don't, don't date me, please. <laughs> but uh, but I think we have a different situation now, which is it's not really both in culture and with the 2024s where you don't really do that anymore. So if the 25 year old has a great idea and is really doing something incredible with machine learning, then they should present it to the executive committee of the board. They should get accelerated and new jobs that are being created are different now. So when I was growing up, you did marketing, you did sales, you did marketing and sales, you ran a country, you ran a region, you ran the mm -hmm. big country. Mm -hmm. but you did, you, it was, you'd done all the jobs of the people below you. Now there's a path for the next gen of talent to go all the way to the top of the pyramid in a more non-traditional way, because the new skills and tools are much more fascinating. When, if you'd have asked me five years ago, Paul, how do you get to the top? I said, I ran a country and I did this. Oh yeah, I must run a country. There. Oh yeah. So now I would say it's very hard to be a CEO. And I would argue perhaps not even wise to be a CEO unless you've done some of the traditional roles, but you've also had a massive data disruption experience on your resume. And it's a blend, right? Ultimately, the winning teams are people who've yeah. been around a bit and know that there's, we tried something like this and it didn't work. And then the next gens who are saying, have you thought about it using big data? You might get a different insight. That's the magical blend that we're all trying to get to. But it does mean the AI revolution, the fourth industrial revolution means that the up and comers have a chance to get accelerated and slingshotted if they want that. This is the redefining moment in our industry, the search industry and recruiting chief executives across industries. Yeah. If they haven't already been through a transformation, yeah. a, a significant data transformation in any industry, they're yeah. probably not going to be CEO by just running up the time and yeah. seniority. It's not going to happen. But that's how we need to rethink it too. I think you do. I, again, I'm trying to make sure that people that will compete for my role on succession are better equipped than I was. And I knew a lot, but perhaps much of what I knew was the traditional building blocks. I just think that's changed. I think you're mm. seeing it. Mm. And I think it takes a bit of courage for if you're, I don't know, 35 to 45, you've been told you're talented, you can go all the way and your next job could be running North America, right? And you know it, you understand it, you know, it looks great in your resume. And then somebody says to you, I'd like you to pilot the data disruption of manufacturing. Now, suddenly their heads are going, I'm not, are you, yes, but it's not really easy for people to understand outside the company. And let's be clear without me telling you, I might 
leave the company at some point. I need to have all of the tools so it all makes sense. But, and you have those moments with people. And I just think that, that I say to them, look, in the end, the people you'll compete with for the CEO jobs and other jobs like this, they will have collected the essential skills to be able to lead businesses for the next decade plus. And you have to decide if you want to go that route, if you want to go as far as you can, at some point there's a moment and it's thrilling really that nobody has got the perfect playbook. And so it's a moment of truth for people, right? A, re a, a redefining moment, but I think yes. that's so exciting for everybody. Jumping a little bit, sustainability, not only have you made goals about carbon neutrality and net zero emissions, the question again goes back to leadership and embedding this in the business operations and the strategy of the company. So moving past the goals and progress, yeah. how are you making it happen? There's beyond AI, there's two big subjects on there. There's values and there's sustainability and they're very close together. And what I love about this company is also what's frustrated me at times. This company is full of entrepreneurs. And I remember going to one of our brilliant sites, Aramon, in, in towards the south of France. And as I pulled into site, I've been in the company in a few weeks, I was struck by this massive solar farm. And I said to them, oh, I didn't know we had a global solar initiative. I'd only been in the company five minutes. They went, we don't. We just thought it was the right thing to do. Hmm. And, we're, and you're like, great. Now, I get the flip side when they want to do something that is globally that is not a cool idea and people do it anyway. That's the flip side of the entrepreneurship. But we have a good heartbeat in the company on sustainability. And you find a lot of people come, coming up with ideas to try and have less impact on society in terms of waste or wastewater management or abuse of energy. And people are very entrepreneurial and it's to be encouraged how we do that. I think it's table stakes. If you don't do it now, I think consumers are much more discerning. They're looking to see whether you care. And so we have the commitments, but we're back to this poster by the elevator, aren't we? Are you just putting it up there so that people feel proud when they have a minute waiting? Or are you living and breathing it? And that can be tough because it can often mean an increase in cost. Yeah. But if you're trying to do it for the right reasons, then it's, it's really rewarding. And I've always felt some responsibility to the environment, but it's funny, it crept up on me as CEO that actually it's, I, it's very important for me to lead a charge here because I, I, if I don't set the right tone, people might slip away. And also, I really like to do it. Subject is so vast that we have no choice but to have an impact and run a successful business. I think in this world we live in today, you must achieve success to reinvest in R&D in our case and reward shareholders, make it a fun place to work. And, and you must remember your impact on society. And it, yeah, I was talking to, to somebody last week about this, that it used to be people joined the company because of its values. Now people ask why the company's values are not the same as theirs. And that's a very defining or redefining moment. So whether it's the murder of George Floyd, whether it's Israel, Palestine, whether it's uh, Russia, Ukraine, people expect the company to have a position. And often it's expected that the position is the same as the individual. That's what the individual would like, because they right. would like to see the company is aligned to them. You've talked very passionately about the social impact work that you do at Sanofi. Yeah your ability to bring affordable access to healthcare for some of the toughest and most, yeah, the, the toughest diseases out there, the innovation that you have for vulnerable communities. We were quite struck, given that Paris will be hosting the Olympic Games this yeah. year, that yeah. your organization is going to be sponsoring 14 athletes. So we'd yeah. love to just hear a bit more about that, what it means for you and being such an important employer in France. We know, so I was a, a little bit involved in London 2012 and I went on this journey, I think like most of the country will never win the bid. We won the bid, we're so proud. Oh my gosh, it's going to be so expensive. We'll never be ready on time. Oh, we're so embarrassed, it's not going to be ready. Oh, it was ready on time and it's incredible. We've never been more proud. Followed by, uh, it was too expensive. The traffic was terrible. Everybody goes on this journey, but there is a period of 
absolute celebration of high performance, both Olympic and Paralympic. And the second Paralympic is why we got involved. We got involved because we love excellence, because it's been 100 years since it's been in Paris. Uh, it's likely it's the only time while I'm here that Paris will uh, host the, the Games. And it gave us an opportunity to have a really active dialogue around elite performance with people who have a challenge or a, a disability or whatever it may be and have a conversation that is much more open and much more constructive rather mm -hmm. than people shying away because we don't have the right words. I don't always have the right words, but I know I care. And so we sponsor Paralympians and Olympians. And we sponsor them from around the world in France too. People, brilliant swimmers who've lost limbs, all limbs. We have over 2,000 volunteers from around the Sanofi world who will come and support the games and para games. We, we, we will, they, we'll give them two weeks off to go and work in the media center or drive athletes or, cause this is a once in a generation moment. And, but, but. If you wanted to volunteer for Sanofi, you had to have some evidence of volunteering in your own community because we wanted people, excuse me, who really care and go out of their way to help. And we rewarded them, if you like. We had 11,000 employees ask if they could be a volunteer. We had to choose <laughs> 2,024 of them in the end. Brilliant. Half of them be from France, of course, half from around the world. Yeah. We sponsored these athletes and we're tracking. And as these athletes qualified for the Olympics, then, then we celebrated with them. I had the opportunity to go to the World Para Athletics Championships here in Paris, even to present medals. And it's really interesting for me because it's a learning journey for me. I was, had to be reminded before I presented medals that the athlete may not be able to receive the medal. You should ask them, can you put it around their neck? Simple, right? Really simple. But part of my education, mm. part of our company's education, is seeing all walks of life, whatever the challenges they faced or not, is to see people as the best version of themselves and see the value they bring to themselves, to society, to the company. And I, we run an amazing healthcare company. We're going to do incredible, miraculous things for patients. And it's not, it's not a, something optional to care about society. And like I said, you can do both. You can really do both. Mm -hmm. And I found the Olympics and Paralympics have created a dialogue that wouldn't have existed any other way about performance, elite performance, about ability, disability, and about excellence across all. And I'm really super proud of that. We end each podcast with some rapid fire questions. We ask you a series of questions and you respond instantly, just right away. Are you ready for the first question? Sure. Perfect timing. Since you're sponsoring the Paralympic athletes and Olympic athletes, if you could play any Olympic sport yourself, what would it be? Oh, I'd love to have rowed, but I would have always been the answer, but I love the break dancing. We have this French national champion, Danny Dan, we hope that's <laughs> the gold medal, but I can't dance. What's the best leadership advice you've received? A few things, maybe treat others like you want to be treated yourself. I'm very aware of that. Take your work seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. Number three, sleep is important for our health. We all know that. As a busy CEO, how many hours of sleep do you typically get each night? I try and get between six and seven hours sleep. Often it can be a little bit less. We all know how important sleep is. If I want to be in peak performance to try and deliver a great day, I need to get sleep. We have a lot on our minds, and sometimes you have to really have some practices to try and help you do that. I think it's underrated and completely important. Are you a morning person or night owl? Night owl. Night owl. I'd rather come in a little bit later, have a few coffees, and stay very late. Sounds very French to me. What's the one subject you'd like to learn more about? What's the one subject I'd like to learn more about? I, I, we started the conversation on AI, and I'm a, passionate about actually creating the environment for it. But could I code? Is it worth me trying? Do I have any value to add? I'd like to have a go. And so maybe I will, maybe I'll have to wait until after I've done the job, but yeah, I'm a, a curious person, lifelong learner would really love to know more of the nuts and bolts. I have to make do with just trying to create the right environment for now. And final question, 
What is one piece of advice you'd give to the next generation of leaders? I think for the next gens, I would say worry less about climbing the rungs of the ladder and focus more on collecting the incredible experiences that will make you a more inclusive, high-performing leader. We didn't really talk enough about DNI. We didn't have that moment, but as a values-based uh, company, I think you really need to be diverse, inclusive, and I think people need to collect experiences. That's what I, that's what I tell my children now. Paul, thank you again for being here. The depth and breadth of what we covered, amazing. A lot to take away. And just in summary, you, you step into a company and a, and a pandemic happens. And as you said, you saw the company at its best quite quickly. But then the goal now is not to take three years to get to best. It's maintaining best from where you started. And AI probably helps you do that. You mentioned that there is no playbook. So this is a disruptive moment to take advantage of. And you're probably the only healthcare company where the whole company is using AI and being pushed to use it not pilots here and there, but make it part of the culture of the company. I think you said it best when AI may beat humans, but humans and AI beat AI. So leveraging that combination of human judgment and technology gives you an enormous opportunity, but yet we have to look at the ethics of how it's used. And you talked about federated learning, where you're training the algorithms on huge data sets outside the company. When the algorithms return to the company, they're better and smarter than they were before, but all the data sets they looked at are left outside. Keep the ethics of what's being examined and how it's learning different outside and inside. But also in thinking about how you put medicine to work also around ethics is working with payers to understand the applications of large groups of patients, but also paying and investing in small groups of patients. So we have that balance of doing what's right for those who are ill with where we can help the most people possible, like the RSV vaccine for babies. To make those leaps forward as a company, you had the cultural transformation. It wasn't posters around, but it was about giving people permission to take risk so you could accelerate the movement forward as a company. You said, listen, if you take risk for the right reasons, for healthcare, not for ethics or compliance, then we've got your back and you may save a life. And so this concept of taking risk when you're putting so much into R&D for 10 years at a time can really take leaps as a company. And your leaps as a leader, you said, listen, I want to get known for two things, for being a talent developer and secondly, giving the resources to that talent to make the fastest move forward that we can as a group. And the changing nature of your workforce, your inverted pyramid of the most successful people, maybe the younger people who grew up in a mobile-first, data-first world where they're digital natives. The 25-year-old may have the great idea by leveraging machine learning. And you and I grew up in a world where did I run a country or did I run a function? But your point was to collect experiences, not necessarily geographies or functions, to make sure that you can go further faster in your career this incredible acceleration to do more than they could have done before. It's not what you did or where you were to know more. But in this moment, it's thrilling because it's a redefining moment for science and for careers. And we look at that across the number of areas you're involved in, not just the drugs, but the sustainability, and saying we have to live and breathe a sustainable world that we can be commercially successful and do the right thing at the same time. There are no choices here. You don't have to make choices about commercial success or impact. So finally, as we wrap up, we think about this culmination of values, of risk-taking, of AI and talent. They come together to redefine a company, to redefine healthcare solutions, and redefine really how we can find leaders. And our industry sees the same thing. We're redefining who makes great leaders in the past they have come from to be great leaders. Really informative, Paul. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for provoking some new thinking on our side. Em and I had a fantastic discussion. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for making the time. There's incredible things going on at Sanofi as a healthcare company. It's going to be yeah. a very important healthcare company over the rest of the decade. We're not perfect. We may never will be, but we're trying our best. 
Thanks for redefining what the company is and what's going on in the industry.